on this series about the grace of God, and uh, we talked last week about the basic levels of God's grace. And what I mentioned to you last week was that I had heard this teaching in this sermon, and had, in this sermon was a study that talked about how the number one thing that could help you grow in your relationship with God was an understanding of, somebody say, the grace of God. When we understand God's grace, we're able to mature in our lives. Now, I was talking to some people yesterday, and you might not know this, but maturity in the body of Christ is not optional, although some of us act as if it is. God wants us to grow in the nature of his son. God wants us to grow in the nature of Jesus. Now, last week I gave you a basic elementary definition of grace, which was the unmerited favor of God, a gift I did not deserve. And that's the foundation. Amen? So we know this. I could not earn it. Somebody say, I can't earn it. And I didn't deserve it. That's the basic level of grace. I want to take you up one step in Jesus' name. Amen? Strong's Dictionary which is a Greek dictionary. It defines the Greek word grace that is used in the text, meaning the Bible, as also, this is part of the definition, the divine influence upon the heart and its reflection on the life of a believer. It's God's divine influence on your heart after you've been saved that it rests on you and it causes a change in your very heart, the heart not being the, the cardiac system of your body, but the center of who you are, the seat of decision and moral authority in your life, that is the center of who you are in the Bible says heart. But it, by grace, God's grace does something in your, somebody say my heart. And what it does is it impresses the nature and the power of God on your life. So grace is not just the means by which we are saved, right? It's also the means by which we gain access to the divine nature of God, to the divine power of God in our life. So by grace, I am saved, but also by grace, God gives me the power to be able to walk like Jesus. And we see this illustrated in a very familiar passage of Scripture with an apostle whose name is Paul. And Paul writes this in 2 Corinthians chapter 12, verse 7. So to keep me from becoming conceited because of the surpassing greatness of the revelations, a thorn was given me in the flesh, a messenger of Satan to harass me, to keep me from becoming conceited. Three times I pleaded with the Lord about this, that it should leave me. But he said to me, my grace is sufficient for you, for my power is made perfect in, my weak, in weakness." Therefore, I will boast all the more gladly of the weaknesses so that the power of Christ may rest upon me. For the sake of Christ, then, I am content with weaknesses, insults, hardships, persecutions, calamities. For when I am weak, then I am, somebody say with me, strong. In my weakness, I'm strong. Paul, the great apostle, writing here that God's grace is far beyond just why the, the, the means by which we are saved, but it does something inside of our hearts where the divine nature of our Father comes over us and we're empowered to do things where previously we could not do them. And a very simple human explanation for this might be my children who refuse to go upstairs unless I go up with them. And I says to one of them last night, I says, have you ever seen a monster down upstairs? And she said, no, but they can come. <laughs> the true story. This is my life. I'm like, go brush your teeth. You have to come with me. I spent years, me and your mother, teaching you how to brush your teeth so I would not have to go with you. <laughs> me and my wife, we moved a bedroom downstairs. The kids are upstairs now. They have their own floor in their mind. But apparently their floor needs a chaperone in the spirit. <laughs> and so I says, baby, there's an alarm system in the house. Nobody can get in the house, but they can come to the windows. But the windows have locks on them so nobody can open it all the way. But somebody can still try. I'm like, would you just go upstairs? And she's like, you got to come with me. And by this point, she's whining. Do I have any parents in the building here? In her weakness, my heart was moved to the point of not knocking her out and just walk upstairs with her. And so I go up with her. And now she's boldly brushing her teeth with daddy by her side. Grace empowers you to do things you couldn't do by yourself. Grace empowers me to do things and endows me with power that I otherwise could not do. Now, these verses, if you've been in church for any amount of time, they might be familiar to you, right? 
where my grace is sufficient for, for you. My power is made perfect in weakness. And this is Paul. And Paul is writing to the church in Corinth. And Paul actually planted the church in Corinth. But when he left, people started coming into the church and kind of diluting and saying that Paul wasn't an apostle. He wasn't this. He wasn't that. And so Paul, numerous times in his, God, in his epistles, is listing his credentials. And what he's basically saying is, I'm, I'm, I'm an apostle. And I got this revelation. But what he's saying in the midst of it is, is, is God, he, he kind of nestles us in, God, in order to keep him from becoming conceited, did not give him but allowed for something to come in and trouble him. He calls it a messenger of Satan. We don't know what that is. We don't know if it's like a sickness, a mental issue. We don't know what he got going on, but Paul got some issues. Some of you are like that. We don't know what's wrong with you, <laughs> but we know you got your mysteries. You got, you got issues. We can't put our finger on it. But the way you be acting, mm, your friends are like, he's talking about you. He's, this guy's a prophet. No, no, no. We all got these issues. And, and sometimes you might wonder, if you ever wonder why in the best season of your life, God will allow for something to come knock you down. He's doing it. It's his mercy to keep you from becoming conceited. And so Paul says, I had all this going on. He's laying out his criteria, his, his, all his accolades. I had all this, but God, in order to keep me from becoming conceited, he allowed for the enemy to come and plague me in this area of my life. And he says, I begged God. Anybody ever begged God? I begged God to get this off of me. Three times I went before the Lord. Three times I said, God, please take this debilitating thing off of my life. And verse 9, a very famous passage of the text, it says, and he said to me, my grace is sufficient for you. Paul's already saved, but God says, by grace, you're going to get through this. Paul's already walking with Jesus, but he says, by grace. So grace, therefore, is not just the way in which we as believers are saved. It is also the way we are able to access the power of the Spirit of God, because we don't deserve it. It's also a gift of God by grace. John 15 and 14 describe that the Holy Spirit will come. He will be a comforter. He's a gift from the Father. And Jesus says, unless I go, he cannot come. So he gives us this gift, and it's also by grace. And so by grace, we access this power of God. Grace doesn't get you out of it. It gets you through it. That's God's desire. What we got to realize is after we receive God's grace by faith, it begins to do a work in our hearts. Remember definition number two, the divine influence of God on the heart of a believer. Grace begins to influence our hearts. And God's grace being sufficient for us in a moment of weakness means that I have more than enough, enough grace in my heart and in my life for me to get through whatever is in front of me. God infers that his grace is his power. They're like cousins. It's synonymous. Wherever you see grace, you see the power of God. And so by grace, we're able to walk in the nature of Jesus Christ. By grace, we don't deserve it, but by grace, by faith and grace, we can walk in the righteousness that he has achieved for us. We can be holy as he is holy because grace gives us this power. Here's point number one, right? Grace is the power of God to live like Jesus. And now, I don't know about you, but I want to live like Jesus. But I also know I fall short a lot of the time. I know I'm probably not, something tells me, I don't know what it is. I could be wrong. I'm probably not by myself in that. Like, we probably all kind of fall short here and there. Maybe there, 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 here, here, here for you. <laughs> but we all got some issues. But by grace, he endows us with this power to be able to live like Jesus and to do great exploits in the kingdom, right? By grace, we, we see this in the text over and over and over. Acts 4.33, and with great power, the apostles were giving their testimony to the resurrection of the Lord Jesus, and great grace was upon them all. Wherever we see power, we happen to see grace. The greater the grace, the greater the power. Acts 6, 8, and Stephen, full of grace and power, was doing great wonders and signs among the people. He was working miracles. He was doing signs and wonders because of the great grace that gave him great power on his life. It's about grace and power. Acts 14, 3, so they remained for a long time speaking boldly for the Lord who bore witness to the word of his grace, granting signs and wonders to be done by their hands. Again, wherever there's grace, we see miracles, healings, signs, wonders. Grace is synonymous with the power of God because when we have the grace of God on our lives, 
lives and with grace to do something. He gives you the power and authority. Although you are in weakness, he strengthens you through it. It gives me the ability to walk and live like Jesus. And we see this in the life of Jesus himself. Luke 2.40. And the child grew and became strong. He was filled with wisdom and the grace of God was on him. We know Jesus was perfect. He was sinless. He was blameless. He had nothing wrong with him. So if grace was just for saving us, then why did Jesus have it? But grace is much more than that. It's the empowering influence of the divine nature of God weighing in on the heart of a believer that gives us access to this power of the Lord. John 1 14, and the word became flesh and dwelt among us, and we have seen his glory, glory as the only son from the Father, and he was full of grace and truth. If grace was only for saving us, then why was Jesus full of it if he didn't need saving? It's about powering our lives by the power of the Holy Spirit, but it's, again, another gift of God that we don't deserve. It's only by grace that we are empowered to live righteous and holy lives. And so when temptation comes by grace, I can be like, no, I'm good. Because sin wants to beset you. You might not know this. Like sin, it sets you up. It's a setup. It wants to trap you. That's what the Bible says, that you should abandon the sins that so easily beset you. And like I told first service, like, A lot of times sin is not the devil anymore. It's like he just said it and forget it in your life. And you're just sinning because out of routine at this point. Not because you've been tempted, but because you've been falling in love with sin. And if you do sin right, I don't know if you know this. I shouldn't tell you this. It's fun. According to the Bible. You don't want to laugh because you know it's true. The Bible says sin is pleasurable for a season. And then when you find out after the season that you're a slave, it's no longer fun. When you find out I can't stop when I want to, then you become a slave. Then the fun is over. Now you're in depression because this dude don't want you, that girl don't want you because you were out sinning. And it was fun while it lasted, but then when you were a slave to that person and you got all types of soul ties, then... then, Okay, that's not... Okay. (laughs) These young folk don't want to hear that gospel. (laughs) Sin is only fun for a season. And then when it gets fully born, right, it gives birth to death. And things start getting jacked up in your life. But by the grace of God, not only are we saved, we as believers are able then to walk out our salvation with fear and trembling before the Lord. And we're able to withstand temptation because we've been graced for it. The text says to us, there is no temptation that is overcoming you that is not common to man. Like he has graced us for all these different things. God's grace is sufficient. What I love about God's grace is it takes my deficiencies and turns them into sufficiencies. He takes what I'm not good at and he makes me great at it. And when you couldn't say no before to this sin, now you can say, I'm all sad. Because by grace, it's sufficient in my life. When I can't make it through in my own strength, it's only by his grace. But he said unto me, my grace is sufficient for you. My power is perfected in weakness. Therefore, I will boast all the more gladly of my weaknesses so that the power of Christ may rest upon me. God's grace, even when we are weak, even when we are frail and unable to do things for yourselves, it works on your behalf. That is somewhere where all of us should be so grateful because at various intervals in our life, we are very weak and frail. And it's only by this grace of God. And you might think to yourself, well, how does that even work that while I'm weak, like God, he can empower me through grace. If I'm weak, that doesn't even make sense that God can empower me. Here's point number two. God's grace, it weaponizes our weakness. That might sound odd. Work with me here. God's grace, it weaponizes our weaknesses. To weaponize means to make something that was not for warfare for warfare. I watched this one movie, it was a jail movie, and I think it was like, maybe one of those locked up shows, I don't know what it was, but the guy was telling somebody, I'm going to kill you with a spoon. And I thought to myself, like, this guy's, how do you kill somebody with a spoon? Like a fork, I can see it. A butter knife, I can see it. But you're going to kill him with a spoon? He turns something that's not for warfare for warfare. You know, when you're locked up, you can take a toothbrush and make it into a shank. They can turn a pen into a gun. I've seen it. Don't give those guys a spring in jail. Seriously, they'll they'll find a way to make it something dangerous. And it's just like, how do you how do you even do that? Like that's a different level of genius. 
Like, I watch those shows, and these guys are getting their cells searched out, and they have all these shanks. Like, how do they make that? That's the toothpick, and they made a knife out of it. And it's just like they weaponize things that aren't meant for warfare or for violence, and they make it for that. God's grace takes your weaknesses, and it weaponizes it for warfare in the spirit. And where you were once weak, he begins to empower you to overcome, to have a warfare spirit, to be able to go against the enemy in places where you were previously in defeat. He's like, I am going to do this for you. God takes what otherwise is a liability and a disqualification in man's eyes, and by his grace, he empowers us in our weaknesses. He gives me this strength, this grace to do exploits in him, but not just exploits, but to do regular stuff really good. God's grace, somebody say, it's sufficient. He takes weaknesses and turns them into strength. And so many times we try to spend our lives being strong. Culture tells us you got to be strong. And, and when I say be weak in God, it doesn't mean, right, it doesn't mean that I'm saying you have to be in a perpetual place of defeat. I'm saying you have to be in a perpetual place of it being in need of God to work through you. That's a big difference. To be in a place where you need the Lord to operate in your life. When Jesus gave the Beatitudes and the Sermon on the Mount, his inaugural sermon, he speaks of the Beatitudes. And the first one he says is, blessed are those who are poor in spirit. And he's not talking about you being broke. And you should say amen to that. I don't think that everybody in the body is going to be rich, but I don't think that God wants us all to be poor. I just don't think that at all. But what I do think and what I do know is that to be poor in spirit means to know in and of myself, in my own spiritual condition, I am bankrupt to be able to save myself. And so I come to the spiritual realization that in and of myself, I have nothing to be able to save me. Burgos ain't got jack. I cannot save myself from my sin. Only Jesus can. And so blessed is the poor in spirit, right? Because he understands only God can do it. Weakness. I recognize my weakened state and then grace can come in. We see this really illustrated in the story of Isaiah in the temple when he says, whoa, I'm a man of unclean lips. He admits his weakness. All of a sudden, by grace, the angel comes and says, with this hot coal, he puts it on his lips and he cleanses him, right? It's even in the Old Testament. It's only by the grace of God. It's by God's grace where weakness is turned into strength. Joshua had nothing for the walls of Jericho, so God gave him the, the silliest plan. Just walk around it. Really? David was a little boy. He had no idea, really. He knew a couple of things about a couple of things, but he had a confidence in God. It was in his weakness that God worked in him. Daniel didn't have an answer for God in the lion's den, but God had an answer for Daniel. In weakness, God shows up. Meshach, Shadrach, and Abednego, they had an, a, a hypothesis and a theory about God showing up for them, but it wasn't until they went into the fire that God shows up. It wasn't until the trial came that it brings out who God is. Some of you want to know God only in the good, and God's like, but I show up in the bad. Listen, if you only want to experience God in good seasons, you will never experience God's power. Because his power is in weakness, not strength. And you could run to the end of yourself and come to the end of your own abilities and realize you ain't got nothing for the issues you're facing. It's only by his, somebody say grace. grace. It's that grace that turns weakness into strength and helps you not just to walk out of sin, but to walk into holiness. It's not just the grace to help me to walk out of temptation, but it helps me to help others out of the same mess that I was in before. It helps me, that grace, to walk in purity and to walk in the work of the cross that Jesus has accomplished for me. If you feel weak like Paul, you should be excited because you're about to be strengthened by the, God, by the grace of God. It's only by his grace. If you feel unable to walk in the way that God called you, you might be trying to do it in your own strength. But when the grace of God is available to you and you walk in it, everything begins to change in your life. What you might not know is this, is that grace, right? Grace and God's power is best displayed on the backdrop of human weakness. And so God's power is best displayed in our lives when we are at our lowest points and when we are at our weakest state because God can then say, I did all of this for you. Yeah. It's in our weakness. It's so funny. God takes our weaknesses and he uses them as his strengths. Yeah. You may think that weakness might be unattractive to God, but to God, weakness is the very thing he needs to be able to work in your life. Wow. Wow. 
And so you're complaining, God strengthened me. He's like, no. <laughs> God, give me the vision. But if I did, you wouldn't trust me. You see what I'm saying? God, show me the next steps. He's like, I'll give you the next step. You heard the, it's just, you know, that skill right there. He's like, yo, I, I, if I told you everything, you would be in strength, but I want you in weakness. And it's for your own good. So you don't get conceited. It's so that you don't get big-headed. Grace is a divine influence on the heart, and it causes the effect of the power of God on the life of a believer and Jesus is that model filled with grace and truth. He walks blameless before the Lord, right? And the grace of God takes me to places where, where I was once weak, but now I am strong in him. By grace, I am strengthened by the Spirit to walk away from things that I once was bound by. By grace, right? By grace, you can stay sober. It's by grace that you can break all addictions in your life. By grace, you can operate in your God-given identity because sin loves to identify us and label us, but grace also identifies us as sons and daughters of God. Grace identifies us through our weaknesses saying, hey, you can still do this because the power of God is with you. And we spend our lives running from weakness when it's the very thing that is a magnet for the mercy of God and the grace of God in your life, that you can allow God to work in your heart, that you would lean on him and depend on him. When I say weak, I mean that you are in a place where you are constantly leaning and depending on God and his grace. Your weakness is being made into a weapon in the hands of God. Your weakness is God's ability. He turns inabilities into abilities, and you see the supernatural power of God, and now your pain has a purpose, and your hurt is helping others heal, and God is doing supernatural things in your life because he weaponizes the weaknesses that you thought were a liability, and God says, no, 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 I got a plan for this in your life. Somebody say it's by grace. grace. Don't run from the places where you feel weak in your life. Don't allow for the enemy to get you to feel like you have to grow to a certain place of strength before you can operate in the kingdom. God's like, no, I want you weak. And then, and then this dude just starts bugging out. And by this dude, I mean Paul. He's like, he's just like, you know what, for that reason, I'm, I, I revel in insults. I love when people insult me. That's what he's saying. I, I love when I'm persecuted, when I get beat up for Jesus. I love hardships. I love going through it. And this dude's whacked out. He says, he says there, I, I'm going to read it to you. He says, calamities. You know what calamities is? The word for calamities, a synonym would be catastrophe. Horrible times. He says, I, I love it. When I go through calamities, I'm like, yes. Like, but that's a man who's been powered by grace. When you've been trying to get yourself through a situation, you read that, you're like, he's crazy. But when you've been through some stuff and you know only God has gotten you out, you read a text like that and you're like, yo, I know what he's talking about. Because if it was not for grace. The old Southern Baptist down in, in Jimmy Spagger's old church used to sing this song, when I look back over my life and I think things over, I can truly say that I've been blessed. I got a testimony. I can look back over my life and be like, you know what? God has done, did some things that I know was not me because I leaned on his grace. It wasn't by my own doing. It wasn't by my own hands. It was only by the grace of Jesus Christ. And, and, and God takes all the weaknesses, all the areas where you might worry about. He's like, I want that. God often doesn't use the areas where we're gifted at. He wants to use the areas where we're weak at. He likes to do that because he wants to set us up to be able to work in his and by his grace. And but he said unto me, my grace is sufficient for you. Tell the person next to you, it's sufficient for you. For my power is made perfect in weakness. Therefore, I will boast all the more gladly of my weaknesses so that the power of Christ may rest upon me. And for the sake of Christ, then I am content with weaknesses, insults, hardships, persecutions, and calamities. For when I am weak, then I am strong. I close with this idea here. Grace is the power of God to live like Jesus. 
Then grace, right? By God's grace, he takes and weaponizes every area of our lives that we deem as weaknesses. God says, I can take this and turn this into a supernatural strength. It's not, it's not by my strength. It's only by the strength of Jesus Christ. God's grace, though, it saves us. It empowers us. But it does something. It saves us in our life. I love what Paul says. He said it, and it's such a powerful point, to keep me from becoming conceited. God allowed this calamity to come in for me to be weak so that I might then be strong in him. Here's what grace is. Here's my final point for you today. Here's point number three. Grace ensures that God gets the glory. This is big. This is like, on a scale of 1 to 10, it's like 75. Because in our, in our humanity, we want to take glory for some things in our lives. We want to take, maybe not glory, when you say credit. I done did this. Well, are you sure about that? Well, I built, are you sure about that? It's only by the grace of God. And so grace keeps us in this place where we know we're weak, but we're being powered by something greater than ourselves. And that thing that we're being powered by is only the free gift of God, the grace of God. And when I'm being strengthened by that grace, I cannot boast in what I'm good at. I can only boast in what I've been weak at. Are you with me? My wife is like the greatest host. She loves to serve people at the house. The other day, we had a gathering at the house with like 20 people, and she's like, who wants coffee? And she's over there making lattes, and she's sitting there frying chicken all night and doing all this stuff. And, and when she does this, I have two jobs. Two jobs. I told the first service this, and, and I have two jobs, right? And the first job is to, while she's in the kitchen, I just talk to the people. We're a team. Somebody has to talk to the guests. So wives, don't be mad at your husband that he's entertaining the guests while you're in the kitchen. When he leaves them, be like, I was doing a... He has to do that. Or else your guests are by themselves. That's weird. But then my wife says, food's ready. And then my job oftentimes, oftentimes, not all the time, is to go into the kitchen and grab the place that she's making and serve them to people. That's my job. Or I bring cups of coffee out to people that she's made with little lattes and mocha and all this stuff and and she does the foam and does sometimes whipped cream and all this stuff and ice and and straws and all this whatever she does she does all this stuff my job is only to bring it out to the people my weakness is cooking my strength is consuming food (laughs) bang bang (laughs) any husbands here can get an amen my, my weakness, I, I'm not, and here's the thing. I told the first service this, and my wife said this, service, I'm going to say it again. I don't want to learn how to make the coffee. Because then I got to make it. If I got to learn how to, I don't want to make my own coffee. I will not go to a store and buy coffee where I have to make it myself. I don't go to the gas station. I don't go to the bakery. And I don't buy regular coffee at Starbucks because they make you mix it yourself. I want you to mix it. That's why I came to your shop. Can I get an Amen. I don't even want to talk about restaurants that make you cook your own food. Not going to happen. It's foolish. I don't want to do that. So I'm okay with just serving it. And sometimes I fool around and I be like, yo, I slaved all day over this meal. I made the chicken. And then somebody will look at me like, you ain't make that chicken. And my dumb, corny dad joke is, well, we're one, so I kind of made it. But the truth is I had nothing to do with it. All I did was purchase the supplies. And then she graced it her finesse in the kitchen and then I served it but how foolish would I be to try to take credit for what she has done all I've done is serve it grace makes sure that God gets glory for what he's cooked in my life and all I gotta do is serve it if I serve it I can boast on God if I serve it I can boast on my wife and so I sit down my bed is chicken is good she be in the middle of a conversation. I don't care. Yo, this sauce right here, girl, done killed it again. And she's looking at me like, you act like you never ate before. I'm like, I don't care. 
but this rice is real good, Senny. She's looking at me all, I don't care. These beans? Mm. What's next? You know? I always hype her up because she's a great host. But here's the thing. God hosts his presence in us. Our job is only to serve what he has prepared and not get the glory for it, but give him the glory. How foolish would I be to try to take credit for what my wife does in reality when I know that it's all her? And Paul says, I'd rather boast in what I'm terrible at, a.k.a. I can't cook at all. I can smoke some brisket. I got you there. I can do some ribs on the, on the, on the, on the smoker because it's just Saturday and forget it, but I can't really cook. I'll let my wife handle it. I made eggs for my kids once, and they were just like, these are okay. <laughs> Leave it to mom. She's graced for it in this season, right? It's the same deal when it comes to God, y'all. That's a real simple human example to understand that in your life, you can't take glory for the strengths you have if God has given it to you. So instead, I say, I'm terrible at cooking, but God has blessed me with a wonderful wife who cooks. I'd rather boast in my weakness and lift her up than to boast about my weak, about my strength that doesn't exist. Because all of our strength in comparison to God are still weaknesses. There's no such thing as strength in comparison to God. He's not, he's not moved by our gifts. You know why? He gave them to us. Imagine you buy your child a Christmas gift and every day you come home and they run to you, look what I got! I, I, I got it for you. You come home the next day from work, look at this guy, this Barbie! I bought you that. Next day, look at this Barbie! I got you that. That's how we are with our gifts with God. Look what I can do! And God's like, I gave you that. Look what I can do! I gave you that. And it doesn't mean he doesn't enjoy us using our gifts. But we think our gifts are from us. He's not impressed. But what impresses God is when we have an inability and we say, God, if you grace me for it, I'll obey your word and do it. When he puts on your heart to pray for that person who's sick walking down the street, come on, somebody. And you hear the whisper of the Holy Spirit. And you feel weak in your heart. Oh, that's perfect prime time for God. God's often like the last kid on the, on the kickball field getting picked. He's like, I, I'm waiting for you to run to the end of yourself to let you know that I am the person you need. And when you give God those opportunities, he shows up and then he shows off. Grace makes sure that God gets all the glory for what is in my life and that I can't do anything in and of myself apart from God. It's only by his grace. Come on, stand with me. It's by his grace. It's not by Lewis's giftedness. It's not by my greatness. It's only by his grace. Years ago when I took over this church, it was only by his grace. And everything God has done in these 13 years has only been by his grace. Everything in your life is only by the grace of God. And you need to reevaluate your perspective if you think it was you. You need to realize that even if it was in your strength, God gave you the strength. If it was with your talents, God gave you the talents. If it was with your livelihood, God gave you your livelihood. If it was with your brain, God gave you your brain. If it was with your intellect, God gave you your intellect. If it was in your weakness, then that was God. At the end of it all, he is the genesis of all good things in my life. That's who he is. Let's bow our heads for a moment. Oh, Jesus. So grateful for your, your presence, your sweet just presence in this room. If there be any among us, Lord, who don't know you as their Lord and Savior, I pray that you would, by your grace, Show them their need of you right now. Can't save ourselves, can't do it for ourselves. It's only by your grace. But even more, Lord, if there are some among us who in our, in our wrong thinking, in our error, we've taken glory for the things that you have done. Your word is so clear that you don't share your glory with anybody. 
would you teach us to repent in the areas where we have put our strengths forward and become conceited or boastful about things that only you should get the glory for. Jesus, teach us to have a heart that is quick to repent. Teach us to have a heart that is quick to reset and to restart with you. Would you teach us over the next seven days how to revel in our weakness, how to remind ourselves daily that it's in our weakness that you do strong things. That it's in our inability where you show up with supernatural power. Even as weeks ago, Janilla said, you take our natural and you make it supernatural. You do the exceedingly abundantly kind of thing that your word talks about. Only when we rest in you in weakness. And so, Father, teach us this week how to rely on you, how to lean on you, how to depend on you. Teach us that being weak in seasons of our lives is not a curse, it's a crown. That we can be able to walk with you and be strengthened by you and be renewed by you. If there be any one of our brothers or sisters in this room or online who feel like they're in a season of tumult and weakness, Father, my heart and my prayer over them right now is that you would strengthen by your grace. That as we've been worshiping and praising you, that they would have been encouraged. But then as the word has been deposited, that by your grace, you would raise them up and strengthen them. Teach us not to ask you for everything up front but to trust you step by step. Thank you, Lord, in advance for grace for tomorrow and for the rest of our week. We love you so much, Jesus, and we honor you in Jesus' name. Come on, the church says amen.